Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Virgilia, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, Acting Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Mr. Sean O'Donnell, who is the Program Administrator, Public Health, Emergency Preparedness and Response, also for the Department of Health and Human Services. We have two special guests this afternoon as well, Council Member Natalie Fanny Gonzalez, as well as Mr. Kevin Beverly, who is the board chair for the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. Both of them will be speaking about the recent economic development mission to Taiwan with the county executive. And with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm very happy to be here on a personal note, but I think anybody with solar panels appreciates this. Uh, today is another day, one of several now, where I've put more money into the more money or more electrons into the grid than I've taken off the grid. So anybody with solar power knows the joys of actually watching the sun supply your energy. And many of you out there who are listening are actually eligible for this. Uh, it's been a busy and exciting week with the end of Maryland General Assembly and the start of the FY24 operating budget hearings and other news. Before we get to your questions and other matters, I think it's important to talk about our trip to Taiwan I returned from last week. Uh, it's the first time that as county executive, I've been able to make this kind of trip uh, to cultivate new relationships for future businesses and academic opportunities. I was originally invited to attend the Smart Cities Conference and speak on global warming, but I realized when I was going over there that it made sense to bring people from our economic development department and try to bring some small businesses along with us, along with people who are interested in smart cities. And so we took advantage of the trip uh, to bring some other people to actually work on economic development opportunities for the county. We had a lot of meetings with company leaders and with the leadership of two universities there. And on both sides, people were looking for opportunities to partner with innovative companies and research organizations or looking for opportunities to plant their flag in America, or in the case of five companies that we brought, uh, to find opportunities for them in Taiwan. We're very excited to find that people there actually knew Montgomery County. Uh, we met people who graduated from the University of Maryland. I actually met somebody who graduated from Montgomery College and the University of Maryland. And those folks had lived in the county. They'd worked often at NIH. Uh, some of them worked in pharma companies. Some of them actually have pharma companies that they started over here. So it was good going into an environment where we weren't completely unknown. And it really helped when we were in meetings with people who didn't know Montgomery County so much to have people who knew Montgomery County able to speak from their own experiences about why this was a good place to come and a good place to start business. And so it was really it was really helpful to us. I also believe the trip was a good opportunity to get the word out about the University of Maryland Institute for Health Commuting Project with AI industry leaders. Uh, when they talk about America's biotech footprint, their initial thoughts tend to go to Silicon Valley or Boston. The Institute coming into Bethesda is gonna help change that perception. And having a research facility on the cutting edge of applying computational biology to medical research is gonna help elevate our region into one of the premier places for life sciences in the world. And there was a great interest at the two universities, particularly the um, university tied to the hospital in Taipei um, to do this kind of work is because some of this work is work they're already interested in for themselves. So I think everybody saw opportunities to explore collaborations. I wasn't alone in Taipei, as I said, and joining me there and here today are Council Member Natalie Fana Gonzalez and Kevin Beverly from Montgomery County's Economic Development Corporation. I wanna welcome them in now and let them share their own experiences about the trip and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Um. Thank you for the introduction. I, I would just add very quickly that it was such a great pleasure to uh, advocate and promote Montgomery County overseas. It was wonderful to see the, the amount of people interested 
in Maryland and specifically Montgomery County and learning uh, about the talent that we have and the quality of life that we have in Montgomery County and creating those re relationships uh, and opportunities for them to come. I look forward to uh, reconnecting with many of the companies that we met and and even university universities that we also connected with uh, to visit Montgomery County. Um, so stay tuned. Kevin. Oh, thank you, Council Member uh, Gonzalez. Um, I would uh, echo the comments that you've heard so far. I think the important part was, you know, understanding what the uh, a bit around that part of the, the world. It's one of the really high functioning democracies there. It's it's not a huge place by 24 million in population, but they have grown into such a juggernaut around chip and manufacturing. Not only are they doing that work, uh, some of their lessons learned are things I think as we bring up some of the work that we're trying to do, it's, it was good to see. Lots of technologies that um, haven't had an opportunity to really explore deeply, it, it presented that for us. And again, our small businesses, as the county executive mentioned, had an opportunity to meet with some organizations there, start some relationships that I think uh, uh, may make sense for them and certainly opportunities for the county to explore going forward. I mean, an international strategy is an important strategy to have as the world just becomes smaller. And I think, uh, I think Ty uh, Taiwan is certainly an interesting environment considering where it sits and uh, what we see as our opportunities here in the U.S. Well, thank you both for those uh, opening remarks and introductions. Uh, members of the media, we're going to open it up right now for questions regarding this economic development mission to Taiwan. Anybody has any questions, please uh, use the chat and let us know. We'll give you a second or two. Any questions for the council member and or Mr. Beverly or the county executive? I don't see any questions, lady and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I guess we continue with the public health update. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so this month, um, is makes it a month since we introduced our FY24 operating budget. And this week, the council will hear from 150 residents across four public hearings about the proposal. Uh, you can see in the little graph above a dollar bill and get a sense of, you know, what part of the budget goes where. And so you can see pretty clearly that um, 14 cents goes to um, the public school system and another five cents goes to Montgomery College, not 14 cents, what do I say? 51 cents goes to the public school system and another five cents goes to Montgomery College. So that's um, 56 cents out of the dollar that are going to education in the county. Uh, public safety itself gets 12 cents uh, debt service, the, uh, the money we pay to build the schools and the transportation of the county, <coughs> that gets seven cents. Health and Human Services get six cents, and then transportation and environment get four cents, and park planning get three cents. <clears throat> so schools are obviously the biggest driver. Excuse me, in our budget, this budget has a seven point seven percent increase over last year's budget. I'm recommending um, growing, even as experts are forecasting a mild recession, because I believe there's a strong need to retain the services that we added during the pandemic. Um, the state's projecting a very mild recession, a $400 million drop in statewide revenues, <clears throat> which is a relatively small amount compared to their total revenues. It's like 0.5%. And people do not anticipate the recession will be longer deep. And a number of our indicators are likely to stay strong and hopefully we'll see a recovery in the housing market if the Fed eventually drops interest rates back to a realistic level, we, we know that home buying and selling is going to resume again. And our budget was you know, majorly impacted um, by the loss of transfer fees and recordation taxes because when the Fed um, sent interest rates soaring, they also sent um, housing sales and housing starts plummeting. 
So we have reason to believe that this is a short-lived um, recession created by the Fed, not by necessarily natural forces, and that we'll be more in line and that uh, what we suffered in loss of revenues in the one area this year will not uh, become a trend. There's also significant investments in Montgomery College in this budget, as I said, and there's a 10%, 10 cent property tax increase. And all that money goes to public schools. We're doing this under provision of state law <clears throat> where you can, um, you can target money for schools only. And with that money for schools only, you need a majority of the council to approve a tax increase over the baseline. Uh, all this, all that increase is accounted for by the salary requests and the other needed funding for this year. So we're not funding things that we had previously funded with this. Um, I think everybody has to remember that the Kerwin Commission required all state school systems to have a starting salary <clears throat> of $60,000 per year by 2027. Like I think $60,000 per year is perfectly reasonable. But in the context of Montgomery County, this means for the first time, whereas in the past, many jurisdictions paid far less than you pay in Montgomery County. And of course, the cost of living in those jurisdictions was lower, so people could you know, still manage. But the day that everybody in the state starts at $60,000 and a young teacher gets to decide, where am I going to live and still make the amount of money? A whole lot of other communities become more attractive. You know, but say the worst case example would be being able to live on the eastern shore near Ocean City and work 10 months a year, be next to the beach and make the same $60,000 that you'd make in Montgomery County. If we're going to be competitive, it just doesn't mean matching other school systems, but we need salaries here that are more commensurate with the cost of living in Montgomery County. And that necessitates the steps that the school system made this year. And even with what they did this year, if the council passes this budget and funds it, teachers will still make less than the amount of money required for a moderately priced dwelling unit in Montgomery County. And when that program was created, it was supposed to be a program for teachers, firefighters, and police officers. Largely, anybody starting in those professions here doesn't qualify for that program anymore. So it's, I think, an important thing for us to do. You know, for decades, we had the most qualified and best trained teachers choosing MCPS because we paid better and we offered better benefits and we had a strong system. And if we're not competitive in this regard anymore, then we're going to be challenged to attract the best in the business to teach in our system. And with the short of teachers in general, how are we going to be able to attract enough teachers to come here? Our school system is still dealing with a shortage of staff all the way, you know, this at this point in the year, they still have not been able to fill every vacancy. This problem is at the core of this discussion about the need to invest in schools. And it needs to be repeated that the revenue in this property tax is only going to be used on education. And these expenditures fund the budget that was that Dr. McKnight requested and that the school board, board of education approved. As a former teacher myself, I can assure you that good teachers make great schools that can create well-educated students. But by the same token, staffing shortages undermine teaching and learning. And if we continue with staffing shortages and continue not being able to achieve the class sizes that we need, that'll just be another drag on student learning that's already compounded by the problems that we know we're dealing with coming out of COVID. When it comes to per pupil spending, we're only spending 80% of what we spent on kids 12 years ago. For anybody who ever says, why isn't the system like it used to be? I guess the proper answer would be, why aren't we funding it like we used to fund it? We used to fund it like we thought it was going to be and would be the best of all systems. Uh, we stopped doing that a while ago, and we never recovered from that. And what was supposed to be a short-term reaction to the recession became a long-term excuse to reduce funding for schools and not restore it to the levels that had been before. And I think in hindsight, that is definitely not the decision we should have made. We should have adjusted for the years that were bad, but we should have brought the schools back up to a decent level of funding <clears throat> before reaching this point. 
you shouldn't expect to get the same result when you spend less money. Uh, but that's what I think we've done. And I think some people um, don't even realize that we've reduced per pupil spending. When I talk to people about the school budget. Everybody assumes they're just getting uh, more and more money and you know the cost is going up. The cost may be going up in real dollars, but when you compare it to the real dollars we spent a dozen years ago, we're not making it. And reinvesting in our school system is the best way to educate kids and keep our community strong and our home values healthy. I was particularly bothered by a, um, an ad I saw from the realtors saying that uh, County Executive Roberts had gone on a spending spree. I didn't go on a spending spree. All they did was look at a school request that I could have either turned down and left salaries totally inadequate, or I'd accept because I recognized the need for the schools to be successful. And you would think of all groups in the county, the realtors would be painfully aware of this because the value of our schools is a large factor driving the value of property in Montgomery County. And I live in a community that knows this firsthand. Tacoma Park was once split between Montgomery County and Prince George's County. A sole difference in property value was whether you went to a Montgomery County school or Prince George's County school. And the values on the Montgomery County side of the line were much higher than the values on the Prince George's County side of the line for the same house, but in a different school district. So if the realtors, the realtors think that undermining the ability to fund our schools is a spending spree, um, if we don't do this, they're going to be faced with making it harder and harder to sell houses in Montgomery County. And I don't think any of us want that. So I would encourage them to take the long view on this. And, you know, the taxes are far less impact than the clients on property value will be for people. And please keep that in mind when you're thinking about it. Um, this is also, you know, about creating a talented workforce and creating jobs and keeping our economy robust and attractive. You know, we hear from businesses frequently about the need for talent and the need for talent is different than the talent that we were producing 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or when I was in school, 50 years ago, it's a frightening thought. Um, but you know what, what is needed in the economy is different today. We need a school system that can produce the talent that's needed, can educate kids so they can function in this economy. And uh, I think in the long run, this is an investment that makes a lot of sense. So I hope you keep a close eye on the work being done by the County Council over the next several re weeks. Um, you know, we've presented our budget it's time for the public to weigh in and then the council to develop a plan moving forward. And, you know, we're absolutely committed to continuing to work with the council to figure out, you know, what, what other options we might have to fund this. I'm not very interested in reducing essential expenditures. This budget has $124 million for affordable housing and $40 million for rent support. A week before I submitted this budget, the council asked me to add $40 million to the budget for housing supports. So they recognize the problem, obviously, because they asked us to put even more money in. So I hope they're considering that when they start making these deliberations. There's also 20 million in here to continue funding the Green Bank, which is putting money out to help people make the transition to solar. And we've got more than $60 million in projects that are devoted to Vision Zero uh, projects that will help make our sidewalks, crossings, and streets safer for everybody who has to use them. Um, I believe this money is pretty essential. It's a tough budget. Uh, we're being hit by the perfect storm of inflation, increased needs, while, we, while we're losing federal funds for our COVID relief and support programs. When we started putting this budget together, we did not anticipate a tax increase. We didn't realize that we were going to have to do that until we saw the size of the school system request, and there was simply no way to absorb $300 million, 222 is our part of it, <clears throat> into a budget um, with the resources that we had. It just was not going to happen, which is why we decided the only way to address this was to send over an increase in the taxes that would cover it. But, you know, in a normal year, we could have managed the normal increase in their budget, but their request was anything but normal. On the other hand, their situation is also anything but normal. 
So it's an abnormal request. These are abnormal times. Um, but our job is still to maintain our commitment to the public, to our school system, and to the quality of life in the county. Abnormal times are not. Our job doesn't really change. I look forward to working with the council. And uh, there's lots to discuss about what kind of investments we need to make in our community. Um, other news of the day. Monday was the last day of the Maryland General Assembly for 2023. Um, throughout this session, we saw a renewed spirit of cooperation, <clears throat> as well as new energy, thanks to the administration of Governor Westmore and Lieutenant Governor Runa Miller. It is really a pleasure. I said this after my first meeting with them, working with a governor who actually wants to work together and shares similar goals and you know, has similar commitment to social justice and economic progress. So it was very good to be working with them and really good to see the work that, that the legislature did in conjunction with the governor. I want to thank and appreciate the efforts of our House and Senate delegations under the leadership of Delegate uh, Julie Plakovich Carr and Senator Ben Kramer, Kramer, respectively. Our delegation brought in more than a billion dollars in direct aid to the county, which is an 8% increase from last year. Our delegation has secured capital funding for key projects like Bus Rapid Transit, University of Maryland Institute for Health, Coming, Health Computing, the Bowie Mill Bike Trail, Burtonsville Park and Ride, the Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center, and our high school wellness centers. I also appreciate the passage of key legislation that will invest in our students, combat climate change, protect abortion rights, reduce gun violence, and legalize cannabis, sale, cannabis sales throughout the state. Uh, we're very grateful for the hard work that led to these legislative accomplishments. One of the wins we had in the Annapolis this session that I was most pleased with was securing one-time funding in next year's budget for BRT and then gaining bonding authority for our bus rapid transit plans. Um, these plans have sat in the county for close to, mm, close to 16 years now. And they've been stymied by a lack of funding, no federal partner, no state partner, and no resources from within the county. Um, and I'll point out, unlike Northern Virginia, where they have the tax to do these things, um, no ability to do this with our internal resources. Montgomery County is the only jurisdiction in the state with the ability and eligibility to move forward with a plan like this to allow the county to self-finance a big transportation project for years to come. And we've been developing plans to expand our flash service along US 29 from Burtonsville to Silver Spring, along New Hampshire Avenue and the 650 corridor on Veers Mill Road to connect the uh, northern end of the eastern red line to Rockville and up and down Rockville Pike from Bethesda to Clarksburg. Um, the help we received the General Assembly is going to help accelerate these big changes. And I want to thank our delegation for championing this throughout the session. This, this legislation establishes a continuing source of revenue to help us build out our BRT system to reduce congestion, make it a greener county by taking more cars off the road and improve the way many of us get around the county. Among the bills Governor Moore signed yesterday was the Fair Wage Act of 2023. Um, as you know, this is the minimum wage issue that I've worked on for many years, and I want to thank Governor Moore for making this one of his earliest priorities, and I thank him for the honor of inviting me to testify, along, testify alongside him to support this important, important legislation in Annapolis. Another legislative victory of the governors that I supported was the CERV Act that incentivizes our young adults into public and community service. I think this initiative is not only going to make a profound difference throughout the state, but will end up being one of Governor Moore's lasting legacies. And my hopes is that at the local level, we're able to work and pair this with programs in the high schools to get th kids who aren't going to college thinking about what they can do and what opportunities exist when they leave high school. Too many of our kids, we all know it, are leaving high school unprepared for the workforce. And we need to think of all ways possible to get them engaged and get them thinking about how to take advantages of, of work opportunities and how to get the training for the best work opportunities. In the upcoming weeks, we look forward to highlighting more of the legislative accomplishments with our delegation, including here on a weekly media briefing. On the national level, um, 
things are of you know things just don't seem to take a rest let's put it that way while state step in maryland took steps forward to reduce gun violence and further uh, protections for women seeking abortions were witnessing an absurdity from elsewhere in the country. The actions of an activist judge in Texas overturning two decade old ruling that the FDA of from the FDA on uh, Mephestone are alarming. The judge has absolutely zero qualifications to make that ruling. This precedent not only puts at risk access to reproductive rights, but also means that any drug on any other health issue could be recalled by our judicial system if a crackpot judge is convinced by people that there's some reason that it ought to be illegal. Um, this is not the way the medical system works. This is an absolute intrusion of the judicial system into something they have no business in treating in, and it's dangerous. It's going to put more women at risk, and that's not something we should be doing. Um, it's just another example of the Republican Party's denial of science and the idea that in the 21st century you have major Western political party that is anti-science is pretty much appalling. Um, this decision not only impacts the concerns the county has regarding protecting women's health, but also economic impacts for our life science communities and our economy. We are home to FDA. Many of our residents and businesses work in this industry that save countless lives through science and innovation. This is clearly judicial activism of the most unprecedented nature from a group that's held bent on controlling people's personal health choices. And furthermore, the actions from the Tennessee state legislature following the horrible school shooting that they would expel two black lawmakers for fighting for central sensible gun control legislation was just appalling in its brazenness. It's also attacked on elections. I mean, if a majority party can simply unseat minority party members because they don't like them and essentially overturn an election, this country is straying a long way from the efforts that were made from the beginning to make this a more democratic country, not a less democratic country. And it's not just racist, it's un-American. Uh, gun violence is a problem throughout this country. We're not going to reduce or solve it by banning free speech. And the only way this current climate of craziness changes is at the ballot box. And I hope that Americans all around the country wake up to what's happening by the erosion of their, of their liberties, liberties by these ideologies. Um, it is stunning that people don't care about gun violence and now want to have a judge make decisions on medicine that the judge is unqualified to make. Um, so hopefully all of us can tell our friends and acquaintances in other states how important it is that everybody work to delivering a politics that's uh, more collegial, that is actually more respectful of science and more respectful of democracy. And I do believe there are people who can be Republicans, who can be scientists, and who can be respectful of democracy. There have been plenty in this county, some great political leaders in this county exemplified those values and there's no reason we should be captive of this minority group of people with very strange views on society. Meanwhile, in the world of COVID, as we prepare to end the emergency phase of the pandemic, we're seeing more state-led COVID-19 testing centers closing. This week brought the closure of testing centers in Annapolis and Bowie here in Montgomery County. We're continuing to offer services like testing, vaccines, and booster appointments. One big difference between now and then is uh, how much support we'll get for those services from the state and federal governments. The operative word here is less, and in some cases, none. The state will no longer be tracking cases to the extent they were before COVID on a county by county breakdown of the data that's been shared with the public regularly. The federal government will no longer be paying for the services it did for the last three years. All this means that we're gonna have to rely even more on our public health experts to help us determine the threat level in our community. For those at home, we ask you to stay up to date on your vaccines and boosters. Keep the elderly and immunocompromised in mind because they're still the most vulnerable to the new strains of the virus. And finally, remain vigilant. Um, our community threat level remains low, and it has been in several weeks. There's no denying that it's a good thing, 
but we've learned a lot in the lessons from COVID and there's no reason to jeopardize our public uh, safety again need needlessly. You know, just as an example, there's a variant that ticked up in India in the last week and uh, the variant seems to be, you know, more attracted to children and seems to be more problematic as a virus. Uh, it still hasn't reached the proportions that had worried everybody previously, but we and everybody else in the world are keeping an eye on it, hoping that it does not get out of hand and uh, that it's not as serious <clears throat> as some people fear. And with that, let me bring you Sean O'Donnell for the Public Health Report before we take your questions. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. So uh, to go through, I just uh, want to share, as, as I'm sure you all know, uh, we will continue to monitor uh, COVID as we do with other reportable diseases. Um, and even though we, we now have a prolonged period of lower transmissions um, globally as well as locally, uh, and we will will let our um, public know and, and and through the media know when there are changes, when when their threat level goes up, when there are variants of concern, or when there are new resources such as new um, types of vaccine and and or th therapeutics. Um, again, we're as we're following along with the CDC reports um, and estimates of the variant proportions, uh, we haven't seen uh, a significant change in the variants. We are monitoring those XBB um, 1.16 uh, and the XBB uh, 1.51, um, you know, as variants that may be um, growing a little bit here, but but more notably in some other places, we haven't we haven't seen a huge increase. Um, and notably, we haven't seen a huge increase of cases. So even if a new variant comes in, if it's not increasing the case numbers, um, you know, it it is not as uh, much of a challenge to our community. Uh, in addition to uh, patients um, at the hospitals uh, with uh, you know, inpatients at the hospitals with COVID, uh, we keep tracking our ED volume. Uh, that volume has uh, come down quite a bit. Um, we're very happy to see that our, our hospitals um, uh, and the turnaround time of going to the ED should be uh, should be better. Of course, we we want to remind our our residents um, to to seek preventative care through other types of providers, um, not necessarily at, at the emergency department. Um, but again, we're not being strained by uh, infectious disease at this time. Um, we do monitor also how uh, COVID is affecting different populations within our county. Uh, just sharing, um, this is something that we don't share every week, but we do, we do get the report on it. And as you can see, we look at who are the cases now compared to two months ago? Well, the, the big story is there's far fewer cases now than two months ago. Um, we saw a, a slight uptick in the distribution with uh, slightly more of our seniors being cases, but this is a very, very small number um, relative to uh, where we were in, in the past. So while we're monitoring it, it may just be that um, our, our younger populations are are less and less having having less, fewer and fewer severe illnesses are less likely uh, to have a um, a PCR test that would show up here. Um, we are seeing that uh, that slight uptick again with our sixty five plus in um, overall uh, a fever and respiratory illness uh, that's that's coming into our hospitals. Um, again, it, it's. It's, it has not gone up uh, significantly over the last few months. Just a slight uptick over the last um, of the last few days. And our our total hospitalization numbers of patients with COVID remains um, remains very low, uh, similar to the previous week. Um, we have not yet passed the threshold of of ten confirmed uh, deaths in our county with a COVID diagnosis. Um, and again, we're hoping that these numbers keep coming down as um, as they have been over the last two months. Finally, just a, a reminder, um, even as we uh, come to the, the upcoming end of the public health emergency, uh, it doesn't mean that, um, that COVID will no longer be a disease of concern, and it, and it doesn't mean an end to county services, um, as well as there are federal and state programs, um, notably the, the testing locator dot cdc.gov is a great place uh, for the community if they are looking for 
a no cost COVID test. Uh, there are when you when you put in the zip code of the area you're in, um, dozens of of pharmacies that are participating in this. And what that means is uh, they're able, uh, if they're able to collect insurance for that test, um, they will do that. But if a, a person comes and does not have insurance, but is symptomatic or has been exposed, uh, they can receive that test for no cost. Um, so that will continue to happen. Um, there, it still appears that you can appear, you can uh, apply for the home delivery of COVID tests uh, through um, to the government, the federal distribution. Um, and there still remains a number of, of pharmacies that do the test to treat program. So if you're symptomatic, um, it could be a one, you know, use that link to find a local pharmacy and it can be one stop where if you're, you have a positive test, they can um, provide a prescription right then for uh, a, a therapy for an antiviral. Um, if you, again, if, if you fit into the qualifications for that. Um, so just want to remind everybody of that. We'll still be doing uh, vaccinations at uh, county sites and with our county partners after May 11th, and we'll still continue to distribute our rapid test kits out through our libraries um, and a few of our rec centers. Uh, we want, we, again, we want to emphasize that it's important for the public when they're <clears throat> symptomatic to, um, to uh, wear a mask, um, whether it's COVID or it's some other uh, communicable disease. We don't want to spread that throughout our community. Um, and and do a test to to try to rule out COVID um, because isolation is still a recommendation if you have a positive COVID test. Um, with that, I'd like to see if uh, Dr. Bridgers has any additional comments he'd like to share. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. I have no additional comments, and we'll uh, support our county executive in the round of questions and answers. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, members of the media, now we're gonna open it up for the Q&A portion of this presentation. Please use the chat. I don't see any questions yet, but uh, we'll give it uh, a minute. Any questions, members of the media? No questions. Lorna, I'll, I'll, yes. just, I'll just add one other thing. Uh, Folks may be following along. Um, I, we've seen some news reports that the FDA is considering uh, allowing a second uh, bivalent booster shot for some populations. Um, and we are waiting to see what that what those criteria would be. Would it be for uh, it often has been for individuals who are immunocompromised or at greater risk. But we we need to wait to see what those recommendations are. And um, will as they go through and become um ratified within the state of Maryland. Uh, if that's the case, we'll we'll be doing those. Thank you. I see the hand up from uh, Ginny Bixby, Mobile 360. Good afternoon, Ginny. Um, good afternoon. I have two questions for Mr. Elrich. Um, one is about Craig Rice um, and withdrawing from the position yeah. yesterday. I was wondering, is that position going to still exist? Are you putting forward other applicants for that position? Yeah, we're, we're going to this was important work. It wasn't a job for for Craig. It was a job we wanted done. So we we will um, commence the search for Plan B. Okay, great. And did Craig share anything with you about that you're able to share about his withdrawal? Uh, he, you saw his note, and you know I respect, you know his view of that. It was you know it was not an easy process. Let's just say that. <laughs> All right. And then my other question is about the budget. You know, yesterday at the council meeting, there was a lot of discussion about how the proposed budget, it looks like there would be a $145 million deficit for next year. And mm -hmm. then there's also this $207 million gap with the CIP. Can you kind of talk about what you think the fix would be for those issues? Because obviously well, those are under a lot of scrutiny by not only residents, but the council members right now. So I'll look at their numbers, but I mean, we hear this, this is like an annual ritual. It was an annual ritual when I was on the council. When I was on the Tacoma Park Council, it was an annual ritual of staff saying that the world's going to collapse and fall in. This is the same staff, basically, that said during COVID that because we didn't you know, get rid of all these people, we were going to have a massive $500 million deficit next year. None of that materialized. Instead, instead of a massive deficit and hole in the ground, we achieved 10% uh, reserves for the first time ever. So 
I I feel pretty yeah. good. And I also feel that some of the indicators, while there's a mild recession indicator, uh, the state's still projecting increases. It's a smaller increase, but still increases. And we were very yeah. healthy on income taxes and property taxes. We expect that to continue um, with some ding for capital gains, depending how long the downturn in the market lapse. But the other thing is we expect that as the housing markets come back, that we'll see recordation taxes and uh, um, and transfer taxes recover to previous levels. So at least on the operating side, I feel pretty good about you know what we can do next year. Again, I've got other suggestions, uh, which I've discussed with the council. I've not discussed them publicly yet for ways to deal with some of this, but. Um, I think you know they have the ability to manage this short of getting rid of services. My my commitment is to try to maintain the services, you know, throughout this whole thing, and even as COVID waned, you know, the council was very adamant about making sure people got food and got rent support. Those things are in the budget. If you want a budget that's a non-COVID budget, you take all those things out but you can take them out and the cost is gonna be, some people are gonna go hungry, that's an absolute fact, and more people lose their homes, also an absolute fact. So these budget decisions have consequences. Um, and I mean, since we're talking about it, I'll remind you that A, this, the county is spending less per pupil than it spent before, which is, is not a good idea. Uh, we've lagged per pupil spending behind places like Howard County and Baltimore County. Howard County's tax rate is $1.25. Virginia's tax rates are higher than ours. You've got a DC study, study, which I know we've provided to everybody, that compares Montgomery County to the rest of the region, has a second lowest in residential taxes, and oh, by the way, the lowest on commercial taxes. And it doesn't change if you include the energy tax. Um, so I'm just saying this, you know, it is not as bad and the tax increase doesn't make us the highest tax jurisdiction in the state. We go from being the 11th lowest to the, or was it 11th lowest to the sixth lowest or the sixth highest. So we go from the middle of the pack to the, the, at the edge of the top quarter of the pack. It does not make Montgomery County the highest tax region and Frederick's taxes are higher than ours now along with um, Howard counties. So if people are saying they're gonna to go to Frederick or Howard, you wouldn't leave here to escape, to escape taxes and go there because they're pretty much like ours or more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ginny. Any more questions from uh, members of the media? Going once, going twice. Okay, guess we don't have any more questions this afternoon. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.